Good morning. I'm going to do it one more time. Good morning. Good morning. Wonderful. What good morning, Dr. Reed. I love it. <laughs> Hello, my name is Dr. Joan Reed. I'm uh, Dean for Diversity and Community Partnership at Harvard Medical School and a professor of medicine. And I want to welcome you to our Harvard Medical School campus and our medical education building. Um, and I also want to congratulate you for coming out on a Saturday morning. How many of you are normally up at 8 o'clock or 7 or 6? We get here on 5 a.m. Oh, wow. What's the earliest somebody had to get up to get here? 30. 4, 4, 30. 30. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, what, I to, what I want to say to you is that this is a sign that you are taking yourself, your academics, your school, your career, your future, um, and recognizing that they are important. You're taking them seriously. And that is a very good sign. It's the kind of thing that we are looking for in terms of potential. So I congratulate you on being here. I am also president and chair of the Biomedical Science Careers Program. And this program today is hosted by both the Biomedical Science Careers Program, BSCP, and Harvard Medical School, my office for diversity and inclusion and community partnership. Um, this is our first skill workshop in person in what, four years? Yeah. We have four years. And so I want to clap for that. <laughs> it's so good to be in person. Um, we have a speaker to open our session today, uh, and someone who I am so glad to know who is really making real change in the world, and it's Dr. Kevin Simons. He's a Harvard-trained, board-certified psychiatrist, and was appointed by Mayor Michelle Wu as the first chief behavioral health officer in the city of Boston. In his role, Dr. Simon will provide leadership and oversight in developing and implementing a comprehensive behavioral health agenda for our city. Dr. Simon is also an attending psychiatrist at Boston Children's Hospital, an instructor in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, a Commonwealth Fund Fellow in Health Policy at Harvard University, a medical director of Wayside Youth and Family Support Network, a father and a husband, those are all important too. He's someone that has many, many roles and he fulfills them all so well. Dr. Simon practices as a psychiatrist and addiction medicine specialist caring for youth, young adults, and families throughout through the Adolescent Substance Use and Addiction Program at Boston Children's. And as a physician scientist, he's a physician and a scientist. He's received multiple federal grants and awards for his work on the intersection where these things come together, mental health, substance abuse, and involvement with the justice system. He's published work on mental health and substance use and systems of care and health care equity in leading journals, um, and is an amazing individual, an amazing physician and leader in our community. And with that, Dr. Simon. How are you all doing? Yeah. So, as uh, Dr. Reed mentioned, I am a dad. And as I was leaving the house this morning, my daughter said, Daddy, you got to take this to your office. So I'm just sharing that we drew this uh, or colored it last night. And she wants to ensure, she said, don't leave it. OK, I will not leave it. Um, so we're going to talk about learning and leading. 
um, because you are all, and if you're in the back, you can take a seat. Um, don't be shy. So we're going to talk about learning and leading because if I were to say, who's a leader in here, who would raise their hand? It should be everybody, yeah. It should be everybody. It should be everybody. It should be everybody. Yeah. So you all are leaders, uh, and you all are learners. So we're just going to talk about my journey, which I suspect, actually, you all will surpass, because you're here, and I wasn't here when I was in high school uh, or college at the time. Um, so disclosures, I don't have any financial disclosures. I have a whole host of emotional disclosures. Um, so hopefully this resonates with many of you who are here. Um, and if I'm going to talk about myself after I actually talk about my parents. And so anyone here, parents, weren't born in America? Awesome. Now, anyone here whose parents weren't born in America, do you feel as though, and this is like socially inter engaging, do you feel as though that's a disadvantage or an advantage? Advantage. advantage? advantage, yes, awesome. So my parents are from Haiti. My mom is from Gonaive. And Gonaive is, oh, anyone know why Gonaive is special? No. No? OK. Anyone know why Haiti is special? Independence, yes. First free black nation. And the freedom stemmed from Gonaive. And if you met my mom, you'd understand why it'd be people from Gonaive that would do that. And then my dad is from Cap Haitian or Bassemble. And that's, they, they came to America independently of each other, 1968, 1969. So you gotta think about like what's happening in 1968, what's happening in 1969 in America, and the world that we live in, where information can get streamed very quickly, um, civil rights is happening at this time. He said, we're going to come to America. So where did he go? East Blackbush, Brooklyn, New York. That's where I, I was born. That's them and me. But before me, they had two other people. <laughs> my sisters, and we seemingly always situate in the same order when we take pictures. Um, my dad's a Roman Catholic deacon, so Reverend Montclair Simon. Um, he was a public school teacher for 25 years. And because he's a learner and he's a leader, when he retired from public school teaching, he went back to school, Fordham University, to get a master's in social work. My mom is in communications. She worked for Verizon Incorporate for over 50 years. Long time. So Verizon, Nine X Bell, Atlantic Bell, South. I know all the names. So that's my nuclear family that I grew up with. And I have a new family. I just showed you my daughter's picture. And so the person in the middle, that's Dr. Brittany Halford. She's an internal medicine doc at Beth Israel Deaconess. And to her left, yeah is Brooke, who's four, and then KJ, he's one and a half. So I share that because when you're going through your studies, you have to have reasons outside yourself to move forward. And oftentimes, initially, that will be your family. But it's not going to be because of your family that you stay at the library late or get up very early. That has to be something internally driven from you. All right, so this is a very busy slide. If we start Morgan State University, anyone know where Morgan is? No. It's, a, it's a HBCU, yes. HBCU in Baltimore, East Baltimore, 1500 East Cold Spring Lane. I remember the address. So. Um, I went to Morgan, I majored in biology and sociology for no other reason than people said you should major in biology and sociology. If I had to do it again, I might actually major in like writing 
and sociology, and then just do the sciences as I kind of needed to. My senior year, the thing that says ABA, I needed to earn money, um, and I became an applied behavioral analyst, which is someone who works with kids that have neurodevelopmental conditions, <clears throat> but I was working in the homes of individuals um, rather than people who are coming to a clinic. Migrated to the Midwest, and I can tell you people were like, why would you go to Illinois? Well, that was the, where opportunity was. And so oftentimes, you may know of an opportunity, be offered an opportunity, and people are like, why would you do that? The why is because it's an opportunity. You should always seek opportunities, because at the end of the day, one way or the other, you're going to get a learning experience. And you better have a learning experience for trying something than a learning ex experience of regret for not doing something. So I went to the Midwest, got into SIU for um, medical school. And I did that after a post -bac. I suppose that there's supposed to be some post -bac students here. Um, and so you know, the, the course of success is not like a straight path. It is rather jagged. And after med school, or I should say during med school, I did a summer at University of Wisconsin. And this will become important because literally in that first year, I just emailed a whole bunch of departments of surgery. And you heard that I'm a psychiatrist. Right. I emailed departments of surgery. Anybody have a program that a student can participate in? And there was somebody. Herbert Chen, and you'll see his picture soon, emailed me back, said, can you get a phone call? I said, sure. He's like, what do you want to get out of this summer? I said, well, what do students usually get out of the summer? He said, well, most get two posters and a publication. I said, sounds like I can get two po posters and a publication. <laughs> he said, OK, well, you have one of the Meyerhoff, not Meyerhoff, you have one of the Shapiro slots at University of Wisconsin. Um, and Herbert is a surgical oncologist. And we would meet weekly. And I was doing pipetting, not exactly what I thought I would be doing. But it was a very good lesson, because he told me way back when he was a med student, he had did a year-long research program, because he went to Duke. And he did it in HIV. But he was a surgeon now. So he's like, Kevin, it's not really what you're studying right now. It's the process of learning that you're developing right now. So I get back to SIU. I become a third year. And I'm like, I think I want to take a year off to do research. And again, people are like, why? I said, there's an opportunity. I don't really yet know what I want to do, but there's these year-long research opportunities. So I applied to two, one at NIH and one at University of Pittsburgh. I talked to David Coco, who you'll see. He said, here's things that you could do. We'll talk to economists. We will go to the VA. They're starting up a new program for nurse practitioners to do residency. We'll evaluate it. We'll look at systems that have behavioral health embedded inside of pediatric care. A project called SKIP, Services for Kids in Primary Care, SKIP. I said, oh, he's talking about a lot of things. David, I like this. So I moved from Illinois to Pittsburgh. And that's where I said, oh, I can ask questions, and people might pay me for this. That's pretty cool. So there for a year, living in an efficiency. Efficiency is like less than a one bedroom. But again, opportunity. Realize I want to do psychiatry. I go to Morehouse School of Medicine, Grady. That's like the BMC for here. And there, I start to engage with families. And I talk to high school students as patients. And I realized there are a lot of families that didn't get some basic information 
in reference to what their kids should be getting in school, like a 504 plan or an IEP. And I said, oh, I think there's an opportunity here for me to delve into child psychiatry. So I came up to Boston to train at Boston Children's. I have a particular interest in individuals that have melanin and individuals that have melanin that find their way into the mental health system at times, unfortunately, fairly often, have justice involvement, and at times, fairly often, have substance use challenges. So I said, I need to get trained in substance use disorder. So I did an addiction fellowship after the child psychiatry fellowship. Now, in route to Boston, remember I told you I emailed randomly for the first research. I emailed three people at Boston Children's. They had no clue who, who I am. I said, there's a award that I want to apply for. And I know you don't know me, and I haven't started as a, as a fellow yet, but I need mentors, and I need possibly for you to be my mentor. And again, they're like, sure, let's get on a call and hear what this idea is. And so I had an idea, really just want to understand the demographics of substance use disorder in Massachusetts. And so was awarded a grant for a year to study while I came. Again, this is very typical for someone to just randomly email people. But if you email people with some intentionality, they may say, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Move forward, I have interests again, melanin hue, substance use disorder. I applied for the REACH fellowship. That actually funded my addiction medicine fellowship and gave me, gave the institution money to do the project. So yet another project. So you always gotta look for opportunities. They're, they really are out there. So, Dr. Reed mentioned that things I've published. Um, so if I said, who's a writer in here? Who would raise their hand? Who's a writer? So it's interesting. Not every hand is raised. Yet I know everyone in here has had to write something. So who's a writer in here? Yeah, you are all writers. You may not recognize that you're a writer, but you all are writers. So there are some articles that I've written, and because some of you might say, oh, I'm not like a researcher. I'm, I don't want to be in a lab. I'm not in a lab, but I'm a researcher. Some of you might say, oh, writing. I'm not good at writing. That doesn't mean you can't get good at writing, right? So I thought to myself, I should write about what I see. So, and I, I've been doing this for a while in terms of trying to write for myself, just writing ideas down. And so I told my wife one day, I want to get published in the New England Journal of Medicine. She's like, that's kind of, Kevin, that's a high standard. I said, yeah, but why not? So went to their website. They have these things called perspectives. And you can search. It's like 14 tabs. You see every perspective that's been written. And I said, I looked, search, 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 and there's nothing written about black boys. I said, oh, that's interesting. So what did I do? I emailed. I said, I am at Children's. I see youth of color. Um, have an idea for a perspective. Before I emailed, I had been writing what I've been seeing. And so when they said, sure, I was able to kind of suggest, oh, I can get you something in two months. And sent it in. Question, do you think they just accepted the first thing that I sent in? No. No, no. OK. So I say this because a lot of people wonder, how is it that you get to this place of quote unquote success? And the reality is, you're going to get a lot of feedback. And it's important how you perceive that feedback, OK? And we're always getting feedback. So 
I got some edits, and I don't take feedback personally. They're not attacking Kevin, okay? I view feedback as, oh, I have to better explain my message that I'm trying to get across, okay? So it's very important to not perceive feedback as a personal attack, but to just see it as, okay, how can I refine this thing that I'm doing? And so it was eventually published, and I didn't even know the attention that being in New England General Medicine would garner. So the average like journal that's published, maybe a couple of hundred people read it. Maybe a thousand people read it. So the Black Boy article, 50,000 people read it. And this is a science you know, journal. This is in New York Times. And so this email is flooding in. I wasn't pausing for a, for a class. <laughs> um, emails coming in. Because parents and teachers they felt seen. And said, oh, can I, can I print this and put this in my syllabus? So again, your ideas, you don't really know how far they can go. But you should always kind of think and dream big. So I said, oh. There wasn't an article about black boys. It's not an article about black girls. I have a little daughter. Published it. And so, oh, it's not a review article on adolescent substance use. Published it. So there's so many things that aren't published, aren't written about, but are important. And the seat that you're in is a seat of power, and not because it's here at Harvard Medical School. And it's really because your brain is inside you, and whatever you dream of is possible. So moving forward, I put the National Basketball Players Association, because classically high school students find that interesting. So I'm a consultant there. And so I like to play basketball, had this opportunity. Um, and so again, you never really know how far your dream might extend. And medical director, consultant, these are some of the hospitals that I've worked in. So now here's a question. How many mentors or sponsors do you think I have? You could just say a number. Five. Ten. Twenty. Two. Eight. Two. <laughs> awesome. So, okay. So, in college, Dr. Kelly, Dr. McLemore were mentors, advisors. And the reason I'm sharing this is you're not going to do any of this by yourself. It is impossible. But it can only be you that wants to do it, right? And so I can have a Dr. Reed on my side, but she's not going to write for me. <clears throat> she's not going to study for me, right? You have to want to do that. And so college or med school, that's Dr. Chen. Now he's uh, chair of surgery at University of Alabama. Dr. Bennett, 
who was my clerkship, or when I was on my psychiatry rotation, he's the person that said, Kevin, you ever thought about being a psychiatrist? I thought they didn't no, I'm gonna be a surgeon. But he'd keep emailing me every month. Hey, we're gonna have an event at the house. Keep emailing me. And I say, you know, I did like when we engage with patients. I did like thinking about the whole person, engaging with their family. If we had someone that had a neurodevelopmental condition like autism that was severe and they weren't talking, how we still could engage and figure out what's going on. David Coco, Chip Reynolds, who was also at Pittsburgh, who helped me get my first, first authorship. Carolyn Pointer, first person to say, Kevin, I, I think you should uh, be in Boston. She grew up in Boston. Now, interesting, this whole row are people who do not look like me. And so your mentors, your sponsors, will not always look like you. And that's OK, because you need diverse perspectives from people just as much as they need diverse perspectives from you. So don't feel intimidated if someone does not look like you to ask them, can they meet with you? Then you, for residency, you'll notice something. So in the training, there's a lot of women, in part because there are not a lot of guys that are physicians and psychiatrists. And again, they don't look like me. I said, I will listen because I need to learn. And I know some of you probably have very strict ideas about how you're going to get somewhere. And you have to be very patient. And someone told me, you can't rush listening, which is very true. Daniel Dawes wrote this book, 150 Years to Obamacare. And he's a person that I had interest already in policy. And he said, you know, we can talk. I get to child psychiatry, and it was Oscar Buckstein, Sharon Levy, and the fourth person, Lydia Schreier. Those are the people that I just randomly emailed who responded back to me. Sayon Harris also helped on the publication. Ayanna Jordan, who's now at NYU, she was the PI director for that REACH scholarship. And in terms of policy, James Corbett, who I met because of Dr. Reed, Kevin Taft, who I met because of Dr. Reed, Kevin Churchill, who's the CEO of Boston Children's Hospital. We have a ghost in the room. Um, I may need your help. I have this. <laughs> um, so Kevin Tab is the, C, the yeah, CEO of Beth Israel Leahy Health System. Kevin Churchwell is the CEO of Boston Children's Hospital. And because of a program like this, but at a different level, have opportunity to meet with them on a regular cadence. And then I met Dr. Reed because she's Dr. Reed. So again, you're not going to get anywhere solo. You need a team. This is what I consider like my executive board. And the reality is there's more people that aren't here who also help support me get to where I am. And this idea of dreaming big. So at some point, you'll think about um, potentially there's something called the Commonwealth Fellowship in Health Policy. In 10 years, you all should apply. That's a program that Dr. Reed and the Commonwealth started. And I applied for it simultaneously while applying for this thing, the K Award, this research award. And People that were on the K side, i.e. the real side, like the physician scientists, were like, why would you apply to this policy thing? And some people that I knew on the policy side said, Kevin, why would you want to apply for the research thing? 
right? I said, well, when I engage with patients, I see the problems as a system, but then when I see the problems as a system, I recognize that there's some policy attached, so I think I need both. And this is where, again, you have to have your vision for yourself. And they said, well, I think you should apply. I think you should apply to this one, or I think you should apply to that one. Well, I applied to both. And then the K, you're supposed to write this educational plan. I just wrote all the classes that would happen in the policy. And I got both. And then I got to say, Dr. Reed, you don't have to pay my salary because this other award will pay for it. It only happened because dreaming big. Just because something doesn't exist doesn't mean it can't exist, right? So dream big. So these are all the things that people might say that I am, and they would be accurate. But I view myself, and I hope that you view yourself as a learner. Because in reality, there is no limit on what you can learn how much you can learn. The only person, lit, the only person that sets a limit on one's ability is themselves. Now you might hear from outside and you might start to believe from outside and that belief becomes a seed and it grows. So you have to have a lot of people on your side that do believe in you so that way you really believe in yourself. And so whenever I meet with people, I will say, I'm a learner. They're like, well, aren't you? I'm like, yeah, 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 but I'm a learner. So I will just share some books that I've read this year. You all can take your phone out and take a picture. Um, and so JFK, we're in Massachusetts, we're in Boston, so it's like appropriate to mention. Leadership and learning are indispensable to each other. So these are some of the books that I've read this year. And not that you need to read all 12 in one time, but there are aspects of thinking about how is it that you learn? How is it that you think differently? How is it that you don't get anchored to just an idea without pivoting? How is it that you win? So this idea of getting to med school, if that's what you want to do, or graduate school, is about winning. And certain people win a lot. And what's their mentality? So I'm going to ask the final question. Well, three questions. So who's going to be successful in here? Awesome. Who's a writer? Awesome. Who's a learner? Awesome. So, I hope you have a great rest of the day, and it was a pleasure. You all can follow me on Twitter or Instagram. <laughs>
even if you're from a small school or a large school, that you've demonstrated some form of leadership. Because undoubtedly, when you're a physician, uh, you will be leading teams in some kind of way. And again, I went to a small HBCU, um, but that was not a hindrance to um, having a successful application. applying for the next level field, but there's also a BSCP conference in the spring. We can do a special session on this. I'm going to ask a slightly different kind of question because I'm also looking at the time. And I'm going to make an assumption that may be wrong, that there may have been a time when you felt challenging to get your first job. Oh, yeah, all the time. <laughs> and maybe you could speak to it because sometimes you feel like I'm the only one that feels this way, all right? I, 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 you ever feel like you don't belong or I can't make it or, or am I the only one? <laughs> yeah, so um, when you've all been in class or uh, assigned a, a study, has anyone ever gotten frustrated? Okay. So it's important how we frame what the feelings that we're having. So in terms of learning, frustration is required. In terms of learning, frustration is required. Now, when you've gotten the A or you've gotten the B and you've passed, you're happy, but happy isn't learning, okay? My son, who's one and a half, if, you know, when he's trying to walk, he falls down, gets up, falls down, gets up. That frustration indicates that something new is happening for you. And so when you feel that, don't be discouraged and understand that you're literally like right around the corner from understanding. And that right around the corner might mean there's a tutor that, that you ask for or you study another day. But that frustration, it actually is required. You see someone like Dr. Simon, and you see this whole list, and there's a part of you, you look and you go, oh my gosh, they have just never messed up, they've never been frustrated, it's always been perfect. I can tell you, anytime you see, say there's a turtle on the top of a fence post, they didn't get there by themselves, and there is a journey to it. So you're going to meet people today who are doing wonderful things, but they had a journey to get there. They had this frustration. They had these moments of doubt. Everyone does. Everyone does. But you reach for it. And you keep your dream of where you want to go. And you pull people around you that support you to get there. And then you end up doing things like Dr. Simon. And you do things like Dr. Simon in ways that he held up for me, it was this holding up what he's doing for patients and what he's doing for communities and what he's doing for science. But he started with a picture that his daughter colored and he's holding up his family. And so you don't have to give up family and your personal to be a figure out how do you stay whole here and have the things around you that matter. I thank you. Also look at your schedule. A list can be found in your program in the folder on uh, the folder uh, on page four of the program book. Or there's a QR code in the program book to show you the schedule for the day. So we're going to go to there's two sets of workshops. The next set of workshops under um, design, some specifically for high school students and college. Uh, the idea of, of specifically addressing questions for these academic levels. For high school students, tips for resume, cover letter, and personal statement for 306. College students, application process for medical dental school, questions in here. Um, that's in this room. And tips for resume, cover letter, and interviewing patients. And for all students, there's an application process and one on finances. And then there's going to be another second set of workshops at 1040. 
Then lunch, following lunch, there'll be a student panel and a panel about summer opportunities. You heard Dr. Simon talking about taking advantage of opportunities uh, in summer programs. And then there's going to be an internship here, so you'll actually be able to see and speak to people from some of the programs, and an advising session. Um, there's going to be evaluation forms that you have. Please fill them out. Yes. We're not going to hold you captive, but you may not go home for weeks until you fill out your evaluation <laughs> <laughs> So fill out your evaluation forms. You get a t-shirt, you'll give us a form. Fill them out, please. If you're parked in the garage, your ticket will open the door to the garage in the building. And finally, early next week, everyone who came today will receive a confirmation letter for attending and a link to more, a compilation of resources and information. So there's going to be follow-up and you'll get more information from us. Again, I congratulate you for being here. I, I thank you for listening to the questions that Dr. Simon asked. I'm going to ask a last question on that. Who here is a leader? I thank you for being here. Look at your programs, and now it's time to go to the breakout session.